Thank you very much for having me here. Um, today, I want to talk about climate change and narrative, imaginative failures and possible futures. I think we can all agree that narrative is extremely powerful. We tell ourselves stories, we repeat them so often that they become intractable, set in our brains so that they are impossible to dislodge. To think about narrative, I need to leave aside poetics and language itself, which are crucial to my work in other contexts. And I also want to emphasize that I'm not interested in narrative or literature in general as a mode of raising consciousness or awareness or teaching the science of climate change. Instead, for me, narrative gets to the heart of a profound problem of time, human time and geological time, now joined in the concept of the Anthropocene. So here is a chart which was made where we couldn't put, we couldn't represent the beginnings of, of the humans within the Holocene or within the larger era of the Quaternary because it wouldn't function graphically. We could, we'd have to make this chart so much longer, right? So that's where, what, what the limits of this chart are. So to talk about narrative, I'm going to actually start out with a book about hydrogen written in Iceland. The author of this book eases us into the science with a fictional letter written by some children in the future to their father. They have traveled to Morocco. There's a very large hydrogen Sahara plant they've gone to visit, and they send their father birth birthday wishes. In fact, he was an hydrogen engineer back in Iceland. Dear Dad, they write, we wish you were here with us. They tell him all that they saw from the window of their experimental cryojet, the oil fields in Norway where CO2 has been sequestered in the ocean bottom. The enormous hydrogen infrastructure providing the world with energy and economic possibilities. Yes, there has also been massive destruction. But why would they need to tell their father? Does he not read the newspapers? Due to the melting of the ice sheets. But now the hydrogen economy has meant a renewal of everything. We are transferring this letter the children write along with a load of video shots over the internet. All is fine, all is good. Now this was written in 2008, a few years after Jeremy Rivkin's influential book, The Hydrogen Economy, under the banner No More Oil and with the subtitle Promising a New World Order a new future, a new hydrogen energy commons. Yet just a few years later, an article has come out asking, what if we never run out of oil? I think that never is to be taken a little bit relatively, but given all the new sources of shale oil and gas, of bituminous oil sands, and other sources of so-called tough oil, it is an interesting question. And again, we're within a very short period of time. Here's another work of that new genre, cli-fi, climate change fiction. <laughs> 40 Years of Rain by Kim Stanley Robinson, written in 2004. Incidentally, he was a student of Frederick Jameson, the great Marxist literary critic whose book Marxism and Form taught us to read between the macro or narrative level of text and the micro or linguistic level. And through that dialectic to, to come to think about new forms of meaning. This novel is set in Washington, DC. It narrates the intertwined lives of a suburban couple. The wife 
is a scientist who works at the American National Science Foundation, one of the largest funding agencies together with our Department of Defense. Her climate policy consultant husband and others, including a group of diplomatic envoys from Kembalung, an Asian island nation threatened by sea level rise. Toward the end of the novel, Washington DC is besieged by a tropical storm called Sandy. Okay, Sandy, as you may know, uh, this novel was written in 2004. I think it's very uncanny that the superstorm that devastated the east coast of the US had the same name. We learn of its force through the diegesis of a local news channel. Just to give you some context, here is a news reporter uh, reporting on Sandy. Um, so here's what Robinson writes. A very cheerful woman was saying that a big tidal surge had been predicted. She went on to say that the tide was cresting higher than it would have normally because Tropical Storm Sandy's surge was now pushing up Chesapeake Bay. The combined tidal and storm surges were moving up the Potomac toward Washington. All of this, the reporter explained with a happy smile. Sorry, I could not find an image of a woman reporter reporting on Sandy with a happy smile, so this is the best you have. Now certainly, the mainstream or for pleasure reader, this is not a, a work of high literature, this reader would be expected to take a certain ironic distance from this prose. To place it in the context of the infotainment sphere, which includes weather news, to recognize a disjunction between the affect of the weather lady and the broad frame around her words. Yet one does not have to be a professional reader to make such a critique. It is built into the prose, a plain aperture on the surface rather than a tiny fissure visible only to the expert eye. After a communication blackout of several days, the parents are reunited together with their two young boys. Safe and sound at home in Virginia, vowing never again to let so long go by without the ability, the ability to text one another. The storm was so large and it's transformed DC so fully that now finally we hope we cannot do otherwise, since the novel does not contain the possibility of reading it otherwise, something will perhaps be done to begin to think about addressing greenhouse gas emissions. <laughs> Even the saffron-robed Kembalis and the tigers they saved from the National Zoo are optimistic. <laughs> Put the book down, on to the next. So I hope it is clear that this work corresponds to a form of middle-brow fiction that, while it certainly addresses a topic or an issue, as the American news media might call climate change, as if one could take a position for or against it, is totally non-disruptive. On the other hand, even dystopian sci-fi set in a post-climate change world may suffer from a similar compulsion for closure and flattening. Dare we call it a heteronormative reproductive futurity? Or shall we say a sustainable futurity, assimilable to two-generational financial planning, such as we often hear? I want to leave the world a better place for my grandchildren. Contemporary sci-fi, in as much as it evolves from the 19th century realist novel or from the Victorian novel conditioned by a view of entropic heat death or even the modernist novel colored by nuclear fear, by an explosive sense of unique apocalyptic event, these may also lack a narrative adequate to the Anthropocene. I was thinking that perhaps ancient epic, maybe even the Volsungsaga, 
in all of its strangeness with its incest, fragments, followed by long and more complete passages, generational disruption. Or let us take the Odyssey, written long before the dawn of this epic. Perhaps these texts, in all of their reversals, prophecies, and with all of the questions about authorship in the modern sense, could be more suitable. Whatever else it might imply, as Goethe noticed, epic requires space, and this is important, I think, for the vastness and globalized forces of emissions. To read epic in this way, that is to read epic in the Anthropocene, again, putting aside language, re involves a form of control, a narrative punctuated with lengthy catalogs, a form of memory or of details. But the texts that we have now in printed form are also filled with holes or moments of great overdetermination. So they don't march forward progressively, as does that 19th century writer of epic novels so important for my study of fuels, Jules Verne. Recall, for example, that in book 11 of the Odyssey, Odysseus is invited by his host, Alcinous to narrate his wanderings to the Phaecians. We learn that in the underworld, the shade of Tiresias prophecies that Odysseus might return home if he can leave the cattle and sheep on Helios's island unharmed. But if you do harm them, then I testify the destruction of your ship and your companion. Incidentally, Tiresias also foretells Odysseus's end here. As Odysseus narrates, Circe cautions him to avoid the, whirl the whirlpool Charybdis and instead to draw close to the unscalable cliff and Scylla's cave. Ultimately, the text that we cherish as foundational for Western culture, when read as form, posits and then disturbs the desire for Talos multiple times. I would say that today, narrative has remained stable. Even if we consider new digital forms such as cell phone or Twitter novels, in fact, these may be even more conservative with regard to narrative. Even Walter Benjamin's melancholy over damaged existence, fragments and ruins is not quite right for our times. I want to suggest that our repetition of old embedded narratives, even in climate change fiction, demonstrates nothing less than a singular lack of imagination. We need only think of the ending of the film WALL-E. Heteronormative robots teach obese Americans how to reproduce. <laughs> or any number of science fiction films. In fact, I think the best science fiction plunges us directly into the world of the future. And while we might feel uncomfortable there, I mean, isn't that the point after all, we don't need a voiceover to narrate the conditions that have led us there. In a number of recent films um, that have addressed climate change with various degrees of specificity, we do find a kind of closure and a kind of neat um, ability to get into the future um, where we ourselves don't go through the process of trying to think our way in there. The Day After Tomorrow, directed by Roland Emmerich in 2004, was censored by the right in the US for its biased liberal views and criticized by environmentalists and for its palliative Hollywood plots and CGI. It was also criticized by scientists for its lack of accuracy, but do we really care about the first and second laws of thermodynamics? It was also criticized for its failure as cor corroboration, especially with regard to the temporality of climate shift. This is the term used by manly but humble scientist Jack Dennis Quaid. Quaid has no political agenda. He's a blank slate 
who simply happens to observe a, rap a rapid shift in the climate caused by trapped greenhouse gases from the past, a sign of what is to come if we continue our sins of emission. So the subtle terminological distinction, not using the term climate change, but shift, allows the film to proceed as if climate change has been, in fact, a mere theory, and as if there is still time for us to repent. The superstorm, as close to apocalypse or revelation as Hollywood can come, finds Jack reunited with his estranged wife and his son, who is united with his girlfriend. There is also, as you may recall, a homeless black man from New York who never abandoned his faithful dog. <laughs> recall that at the end, our neighbors in the third world, or better, the southern hemisphere, have taken us in as refugees. Stripped of our power by the new ice age, we will now reside in the subtropics, chastened, depopulated, cleansed. And in a final disavowal, the vice president, who takes over when the leader of the free world succumbs to freezing temperatures, and who bore an uncanny resemblance to Dick Cheney, apologizes for unbridled consumption of natural resources, but fails to mention the burning of fossil fuels. Emmerich must have decided that he had to sacrifice science to narrative demands. In the film, the passage of time is indicated with editing of the most conventional sort. So to conclude, I would say that perhaps only by thinking about how deeply narrative forms have structured the way we think, we will have the courage to face up to the Anthropocene and realize that weak reforms, no matter how practical or hopeful, are tied to a continuity that will be broken apart, not as one singular explosive event, but as a series of shocks followed by periods in which we may be lulled into a sense of continuity. And that, I think, is the most dangerous story of all. Thank you.